had a good and relaxing afternoon yesterday and good morning today. So you're ready and for voting, for watching, for listening, for participating actively in the sessions. Okay, so we start with Go Atoms. Go Atoms from Bulgaria. So this is Petko Elenkin Bojdar Bozar. Uh, Bozidar Bozov and Iliana Ivanova, the teacher. I would like to invite you to share your screen with the presentation, please. Do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Everything is okay, okay with presenting. Please so, uh, should we start? Please. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Pet Quinn. My colleague for today is Bujidar. Hello. And our teacher is Elana Ivanova. And uh, we are from Bulgaria, and this country is home to a lot of history and even more to nice nature and plenty of interesting people. Here you have the opportunity to enjoy nature to the fullest because we've got beaches, forests, and breathtaking mountain views. Now, because I live in Varna and Bujudar in Plovdiv, you have the opportunity today to quickly virtually explore two different big cities in one sitting. So enjoy. Okay, uh, Varna is located right next to the Black Sea and it's often called the sea capital of Bulgaria. It is the third largest city in the country. Uh, what is Varna famous for? Well, we've got, uh, we've got beautiful architecture uh, and one of the most visited places here is the Dolphinarium, the only one in the country. Uh, in addition, we've got magnificent beaches and if you're interested in history, then you should visit Varna because we've got the so-called Roman baths. Uh, ancient Romans used to relax here and philosophize. Now moving to my school, I study secondary school with language education, Alexander Segevich Pushkin. We study English, Italian, and Russian. You can see here the school has almost 50 years of history and approximately 1,200 students. Now, Bujidah. Plovdiv, ancient and eternal. That's the motto of Plovdiv. Plovdiv is the second largest town in Bulgaria. It is located in the western part of the upper Turkian lowland on both banks of the Maurice River. Plovdiv is the city of the Seven Hills. In Plovdiv, you can see many sites, great architecture, many museums, theaters, the remains of many important ancient buildings, antique theater, Roman stadium, large and small basilica, Roman roads, and more. The Seven Hills, although now there are only seats left, are one of the many things that the people of Plovdiv can boost of. The whole town in Plovdiv is amazing. Plovdiv is a city where you can meet many cultures. In the following photos, you will see beautiful Christian searches. In Plovdiv, there is a, a mosque. There is also a synagogue in Plovdiv. The, uh, this photo was taken from one of the hills and on it you can see some of the other hills and a wonderful perspective. Plovdiv was the European capital of culture for 2019. In the photo you can see the antique theater in Plovdiv. In the photos you can see amazing views from Plovdiv, the old town in Plovdiv, the antique theater, Roman roads, the seven hills, Plovdiv city center, Plovdiv city garden and rolling base in Plovdiv are a small part of our great places in Plovdiv that you can see. Plovdiv is a city with a history of over 8,000 years. It is not coincidence that Plovdiv has had so many names. Evmopia, Filipopolis, Plodin, Popudeva, Trimontium. Plovdiv is a magical town. In it, everyone fights something for themselves. We invite you to come and find for out for yourself why this town is so amazing. We are waiting for you in Plovdiv and Varna. Now moving to my school. I study in High School of Mathematics, Academician Kirill Popov. Profiles in school are system programming, graphic design, and mathematics. You can see here the school has almost 50 years of history and approximately 1,200 students. And now back to physics. In school, we start with the atom and continue with the radioactivity. We stress the fact that nuclear reactors are subject to very high physical, technological, environmental, economic, and other requirements. Next topic include alpha, beta, and gamma decays, fusion and fission, and elementary particles. And what about our motivation? We participated in this contest because we love physics. 
And also, let me just point out that in history, people attitudes toward nuclear science goes through several stages, from the curiosity of scientists, through the euphoria of society, to the irresponsibility in some experiments. But humanity has learned these lessons, and our team strongly believes that nuclear energy deserves more. Now, to convince you, let's look at the nuclear facility Kuzudui. In 2019, this facility saved us 19.5 million tons of carbon dioxide, 64,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, and 14,000 tons of nitrogen oxides. You can see here that the great positive effect nuclear energy has on our environment. In conclusion, I, Bujudar, and our teacher hope that the future generations will stay positive towards nuclear physics. Here you see beautiful drawings from Bulgarian children, and we think they say a lot. Thank you so much for your attention. Now we're moving, now we are to, moving the to the video. Yes, the future is in our hands. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And now I would like to invite you to watch the video. Dear future generations, in the period of human history in which I am currently living, I see a lot of disputes around nuclear energy. Unfortunately, Germany and Japan recently started to shut down their nuclear plants. Particularly, the German government plans to close all of its nuclear facilities by 2022. You might ask, is that a bad news for humanity? Well, let's see what the facts are telling us. Here's an interesting table. We are now looking at the main components of the average yearly dose of radiation for a human. Over 50% of the yearly dose is from the atmosphere. Buildings take second place in the ranking, then food, medicine, the cosmos. And there's radiation from nuclear facilities, only 0.1%. Isn't that amazing? An example is the nuclear reactor at MIT. If you are right next to it, the dose matter will show almost no change. But that's not the case if you take a walk in Boston. In physics, when we talk about something, we have to relate it to other objects. The same applies here. What are 60,000 cancer deaths compared to the 4 million premature deaths caused by little particles, as small as 2.5 microns in diameter, that cause respiratory diseases, and which are the products of fossil fuels? Just imagine how wrong the idea with fossil fuels is. But atoms also have minuses. There's a problem with nuclear waste and the risk of the accident, right? The fact is that in the not that far future, we accept shortages of petrol and we do not see any new revolutionary renewable energy sources. For that reason, in Asia new reactors are being built and the United States currently upgrading their nuclear facilities. Also, more European countries are uh, taking a new look at nuclear physics, which was rejected earlier. Scientists are currently working on generation 4 reactors because they know that our grandkids need a, a place to live that is our lovely planet Earth. Also, if you watch television for one year, then the radiation dose is equivalent to that of a nuclear plant worker for the same period. Isn't that amazing? Again, the question arises. Why are people in my generation scared of nuclear power? Well, my answer is that we haven't shown them enough of the great ideas of nuclear physics, like the small modular reactor or even the great impact nuclear power has on our environment. It's my mission to reduce the, this ignorance in our contemporary society. In conclusion, we truly believe that we need atoms for the future. Thank you very much, Go Atoms. Uh, big applause.
from everyone to, to, to the video and the, your presentation. Very well uh, kept with the time as well. Okay, so now it's time for jury to um, go for questions. Uh, there is a uh, Walter is raising your hand. Do I see it well? It was, not a, it was just a closing. It was, uh, it was just a closing, but anyway, and I can put a question. Uh, let me say, or a little remark, just uh, just uh, that. Uh, of course, nuclear physics has made uh, a lot for um, uh, let me say for, for producing nuclear reactor plant, but now. Uh, let's say it is nuclear engineering more, which is uh, working. And uh, the student, the, the two students actually uh, provided it, uh, uh, let's say this, uh, this consideration by speaking about the cost uh nuclear reactor plant. Uh, a question is, uh, what do you think it is, uh, an, let's say the, the main argument by which you can convince your mates, for instance, about uh, the fact that nuclear is friendly to the environment and can be a solution in the uh, ecological transition. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, first, uh, I think there is a prerequisite actually. Uh, before we talk about solutions, I think everyone must be, uh, must have some background in uh, physics uh, and if that is actually, if that requirement is actually satisfied, then I think that the main argument would be actually, well, we should actually return to uh, what, to the question of what do we actually want to do? Um, I think that this has to also relate to the social contract, which was introduced many years ago. But uh, if we actually focus on that question, what do we want? Then I would say that the main argument for nuclear energy is that it has uh, two, uh, I, I would say, two, fa uh, two phases. The first one is that it can be used for research. And, uh, and the other one is, uh, of course, to produce energy. But uh, having in mind that nuclear energy has two phases, then uh, I think that uh, a, a very small portion of, um, I would say, fuel can produce um, tons of, uh, not tons, but actually a huge amount of energy, which can power many houses. And it actually, the small modular reactor is, uh, if, if, it, if it succeeds, then you, you would actually convert big nuclear power plants into. Uh, Small, uh, I would, well, it's, the facility is not the right word, but you would convert big projects to very small uh, portable buildings, which can you, you can distribute all around the world. And I think that's amazing because many many people will be uh, happy and not worry about. But in general, yes the idea to make everyone happy and to live in a better world. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. I, I believe it is very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Bajita, would you like to add something to this? No, I think that, uh, that Petko said was enough. It was a great answer. Okay, any more questions from the jury? Well, you know, I, I had also more or less the same question, but um, that you, you seem to be very, very enthusiastic about, uh, about this uh, nuclear energy. The, the question is how to share this with the, with the general public, with the people who are not aware about the physics. The, the, they, they, they cannot un understand the, the um, let's say the, the, the scientificality of the of the of the nuclear energy. Yeah. Maybe we can use the show the social medias, for example, YouTube, because in YouTube there are a lot of videos, but a very, very small parts of them are for nuclear physics and, and nuclear science. 
Yeah, and, and even their ex excursions uh, around the nuclear facilities, for example, an ergo atom with something like that. And I think this is a great idea, just to allow people to walk around the nuclear facility, to touch things, just just returning to, to, to the childhood. You, Every one of us was in childhood and everyone wanted to touch things. And that's how we learn, uh, by just showing the general public how everything works. works. Yes, I agree with you. You know, in the in the Sweden, for instance, people living very very next to the to the facilities, the car facilities, are very enthusiastic about that, and uh, they, uh, they are very happy to live uh, in such areas. Uh, usually, people are very far from uh, from the. the from the facilities for the nuclear installation are against. So it would be nice to, to organize some, some visit for, uh, for them. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for, for this answer. Yes, and I just want to make a note. Uh, in America, there is a uh, facility right next to the beach and people walk their dogs. They, you, they seem to not to be to worry about that facility which contains many nuclear uh, waste, but in general, we have to look at how these barrels, uh, which which uh, which protect from the nuclear, uh, which protect the nuclear waste to to damage the environment. They, these barrels actually go to many tests. They're made just so planes can crash through them. The, the requirements are very high, and so people should be educate or, or the minimum is to make them uh, go and see how everything is made in the nuclear facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Petko. Thank you very much, Bojida. There were really valuable comments coming uh, from you uh, to the communicators, uh, to the specialists of communications of nuclear sector. So uh, I fully agree with, with what you would, with your ideas. And we have a couple of nuclear power plants which are really uh, on the seaside and where the people are really uh, taking a bath next to it. Okay, good, thank you very much. Uh, big applause to go atoms. And now we are going to school center Pszkol Sevnica. Um, yes, hello. Yes, so it's Jiga Zupan, David Bosian, Chitz, and the teacher Jorge Pojun, I hope I pronounced it correct. <laughs> okay, yes. the floor is yours, please. So, hi, uh, my name is David, and this is my friend Giga, and this is our uh, teacher, Jorge Pojun, and we are part of the team called School Center Kershkosnevnica. We come from a small country called Slovenia. Uh, it's a part of the Northern Mediterranean European region, uh, we have borders with Italy, Croatia, Hungary, and Austria. We have one nuclear power plant and one research reactor in Ljubljana. And in our country, we also find our town, Krško, which lies in eastern Slovenia. And in Krško, we also have the Slovenia's one and only nuclear power plant called the <clears throat> Krško nuclear power plant, which lies southeast of the town. And in Kursko, we also have different industry, industry, ah, industries, which include construction, metalworking, paper, textiles, wood processing, agriculture, trade, transportation, while tourism continues to develop. Um, our school is in the immediate vicinity of the nuclear power plant. It's about four kilometers away uh, on the road. Um, in our school, we have a variety of professions, electric, electrical, mechanical, and computer technicians, and a technical high school. Uh, most importantly, we cooperate with many industrial enterprises. <coughs> and our school also has a um, unique module called uh, Basic Knowledge of Nuclear Te Technology, where we learn about nuclear technology in general and uh, nuclear power plants. And as shown as picture, as shown on pictures, we help ourselves with special school tools. For example, in the middle, here is a project that was made, which shows the reactor core with the con uh, 
with control rods. And on the sides, there are two schemes that show the free cooling systems of the reactor. And there is also a <clears throat> speciality such as in for this module, because it takes uh, place in the full scope simulator of MPP Kershko or so-called nuclear power plant Kershko. Mm. Um, the most important things we learned about the nuclear power plant in school on nuclear science, um, we learned how, to, how a nuclear power plant operates, how to use the Geiger Mueller meter, uh, the necessary security measures that has to be taken every day, and the workings of a reactor core. And here is our motivation. Uh, our motivation comes from the side, uh, the fact that we are on the technical side of STEM field, which transit to science, technology, engineering, and math field. And we want to also associate ourselves with the industry. And because we want to have the ability to learn about nuclear power and nuclear industry in our school. And the, this project was quite hard to do because we were filming in the time of pandemic, but we were kind of also lucky because all the actors in our video were our classmates. So as of the pandemic, we had to use our own equipment. So we just used what we had, a Canon camera, some sort of a microphone, a little, a little drone, and one and only video light we had. That's all. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, OK, now we have a time for the video. We need electricity to power our lights. We need electricity for computers to work. Can you imagine life without it? We need electricity to operate machines. Can you imagine life without it? I need electricity to heat up my home. Can you imagine life without it? I need electricity for my car. Can you imagine a life without it? We produce energy with hydroelectric power plants. They are a clean source of electricity, but it is limited by nature. We produce energy with gas power plants. It's a very expensive form of generating electricity. We produce energy with wind power plants, which are unreliable and are geographically limited. They also require energy storage devices. We produce energy with solar power plants, but they are unreliable at night and in the winter months. They also require energy storage devices. We produce energy with thermal power plants. They are extremely environmentally unfriendly. We produce energy with nuclear power plants without CO2 emissions and dust particles. It is incredibly reliable and affordable source of energy. Aren't you scared of living so close to a nuclear power plant? <laughs> I heard that you were skiing in the Alps last week. Is it true? Yes, I was. Why are you asking? As you can see, uh, you received uh, more radiation in Alps than me, uh, living near the nuclear power plants in a whole year. That's ridiculous, you have to be mistaken. What do you mean? Uh, okay, I heard that you were talking about that radiation activity. Um, let me know and don't you forget that uh, there is a higher amount of radiation at your basement than right next to the nuclear power plant. Uh, come, I'll show it to you. Let's go. In the basement, the dose of background radiation is 180 nanosievert per hour. 
Around the nuclear power plant, the dose is 100 nanosievert per hour. We also have a school subject dedicated to learning about nuclear power plants, which makes it easier for me to understand everything that is happening in the nuclear power plant. In Sweden, they have carbon intensity of 51 grams per kilowatt hour because they, they mainly produce energy with hydropower plants and nuclear power plants. In France, they have carbon intensity of 61 grams per kilowatt hour because they also mainly use energy from nuclear power plants and hydropower plants. In Poland, their carbon intensity is 499 grams per kilowatt hour since they mainly use coal and do not have other ways of producing energy developed. In Slovenia, we have carbon intensity of 250 grams per kilowatt hour as we use both clean and dirty ways of producing energy. Our nuclear power plant provides us with quality life and good services. So, to lower our carbon intensity, we should build another and even more powerful nuclear power plant. We are ready, are you? Many thanks to Krzko Sevnica from Slovenia uh, to present uh, the, for the video. Uh, we are also ready here. Uh, also the nuclear, <laughs> nuclear team from the ENS is ready. And maybe I invite also the jury members uh, to uh, re-look the videos due to the fact that the, the quality is here with streaming is not always the best so that you have a chance to look at once again and and uh, have a really uh, your uh, take your your decision um, okay now I would like to invite all the jury members to uh, raise your hands and uh, put the questions to the team Thank you for your, your presentation and, and the video. It was a, a very nice uh, presentation. Also, uh, the information about how you made the video was, was very nice uh, to know that you made it all yourself. Also, I see you had a, a really a good scenario to include different uh, parts uh, into the video. So uh, well done uh, for this. Um, you kind of uh, put some disadvantages to different uh, other sources of, of uh, electricity production. Uh, have you met, um, or what would you regard as a disadvantage of nuclear energy? Or are there any disadvantages of nuclear energy? Have you looked into that or? Uh, no, we didn't look into any disadvantages, but I think um, the only disadvantage is maybe because it takes some space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it couldn't be built with a restricted amount of space, something like that. But from as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the nuclear energy is the best and the safest and the most reliable source of energy. Okay. So, um, Thank you for your answer. No problem. We have here very convinced uh, crowd. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. Are there any further questions from jury member? Okay, I think it was very comprehensive and very well done. So there are no more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, there's a question from Walter. Um, I joined Lisanne in saying that the video was very nice and self-made. Congratulations. I recently visited the Krzko Nokia Parkland and I was imp uh, impressed by the extreme cleanliness of the work environment. Did you visit the plant? What was your impression? Um, yeah, we were able to visit the plant, um, not like get the access uh, of the insides, but yeah, we gained some access and um, for us, this is just normal every day. It's nothing really special to us. 
Okay, but it was uh, Walter was very impressed by the how clean it is inside, but uh, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's yes. true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, good. So I think there are no more questions from the from the jury members. Congratulations! A big applause from myself as well. Okay, uh, we you. have a virtual. <laughs> good. So we go to the third team uh, this time. There is a team from Romania, Nicolce, Diana Narcisa Haiduku, Jono Serian Ciobanu, and uh, Carmen uh, Popescu. I would like to invite you to share the screen now. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, one second. Uh, one second, yes, Um, can you properly see it? Yes. So now you can start the. Uh, uh, yes. Fantastic. I see you well. So uh, I am Haiduku Narcisa. And I'm Fabio Nustelian. And we are the Neculture team. Uh, we are from Romania, the beautiful country of Romania. Uh, Romania is the only country in the the world, from my knowledge, which is the shape of a fish. Uh, and uh, most of the Carpathian mountains uh, are in our country, including the Fogarach mountains, which are the tallest points in the country. Uh, passing the mountains is the Transfiguration Road, which was named the greatest road in the world by the Top Gear. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, a lot of beautiful castles, including one of the most well-known castle, the Pelesh Castle, which you can see on the slide. On the bottom right the picture. Well, uh, I want. I just wanted to add that this castle was built by the by Carol the First, who was the first king of Romania, immediately after its unification. And another well-known castle is the Bran Castle also known as the Dracula Castle, which was the home of uh, Vlad Cepes, which you can see in the middle picture, also known as Vlad Dracul, who was an infamous ruler who used to persecute his uh, prisoners and any person who broke the law in his country was impaled, which is illustrated in the picture on the right side of the slide. His nickname, which was given by the population, Vlad Dracul, Dracul meaning the devil in Romanian, was the inspiration from, for Bram Stoker's book, Dracula. We live in the capital of Romania, Bucharest. Uh, it is the biggest city in the country uh, with a population of 1.8 million people and 1.4 million cars which also makes it one of the most congested cities in the world. Uh, in Bucharest, you can also find the second biggest administrative building, the Palace of Parliament, which is uh, second after the Pentagon in the US. And the Palace of Parliament is also the heaviest building in the world with over 1,000 rooms. Uh, Bucharest is also known as Little Paris due to its uh, architectural similarities with the uh, capital of France, uh, and also because both uh, both us and Paris have an Arc de Triomphe, which is uh, the one on the bottom left. Our school, the Ion Culture National College, is uh, a very old school who started as a school in uh, 1923 and used to be called the Mihai Vitazul Secondary School. After that, it became a lower secondary school, teaching only from grade, uh, from the fifth to the eighth grade. And in 1958, it was renamed the Ion Neculce National College and uh, got this distinction as uh, it started teaching both secondary and lower secondary school uh, from the fifth grade to the 12th grade. Ion Kulce, whose name we, our school has, was a 
chronicler in Moldova, and his main work, which is called in Romanian Letopisetul Țării Moldovei, covers the events from 1631 to 1743. And he, we had to study this book in literature class. It's written in the old Romanian language and is very, very hard to read. Our school is equipped with a chemistry lab, a physics lab, a biology lab, and three computer science labs, which we use daily in our uh, school classes. Well, we were mainly interested about the physics lab every day, probably, uh, because we learned a lot of, a lot of stuff, uh, including nuclear physics uh, in the 12th grade. And uh, we learned information from the properties of the nuclei uh, to elementary and elementary particles, including lessons on nuclear fusion and fission and particle abstraction and how nuclear reactor works. Uh, we also uh, learned about the photoelectric effect and uh, we were introduced into the, the theory of relativity from of Einstein and uh, a few principles behind the nuclear fission and fission. We were motivated to do this project by one question that we both encountered when we, are, when we tried to decide what we want to do in our future. What's next? After college, we would have to find a career, to find a job. And as we both aspire to study physics, we were very scared of the, what career path we might take. Of course, we knew of uh, research, but we didn't know whether or not we had other options available. So working on this project, we got to speak with people uh, working in different, who had different jobs in the nuclear field, both in research and in a more um, sort of usual job, like in a company. And uh, that sort of eased our worries about our future and what we might do after. We wanted to share this with other people because I think it's, it's a problem that's very common among students who are just finishing high school, like we are. And this problem became very real very recently when we had our final ceremony in the high school which is followed by our final exams next week. And those grades will influence whether or not we get enough university of choice. Mm -hmm. And working on this uh, project help us, helped us decide on our dreams, basically. Thank you, so uh, thank you very much. We, we, we finished. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the clear motivation that you uh, that you want to wanted to present in this presentation. Uh, so now uh, I would like to ask my colleague Matia to uh, run the video, and uh, just to let you know that um, for, on Friday we will have one person uh, who you had can uh, follow or maybe just ask about their uh, about the career. This is Valérie Foudon, uh, she's director general of uh, SPEN, French Nuclear Energy um, Association, and she will be happy to answer all your questions within the Ask Me Anything session, which is planned for Friday uh, from uh, 2.20 to 2.40. I send you her uh, CV. So you can have a look at the CV and uh, the background and just prepare your questions for her for Friday. So now I would like to invite to watch the Team Neculture video, please. Thank you. Students aspiring to study nuclear physics may wonder what job opportunities they have after they graduate. The popular choice is research. In Romania, one of the most important research facilities is the one right here next to Bucharest at Magurele. Here, at the Horia Hulubei National Institute of Physics and Nuclear Engineering, we got to see two of the three particle accelerators. 
the first was a one megavoltan neutron used to determine the age of different objects using accelerator mass spectrometry. The isotopes used are carbon-14, beryllium-10, aluminum-26, and calcium-41. The second one was slightly larger. It was a 3 megavolt linear accelerator used for ion beam analysis, which determines the chemical composition of objects, ion implantation, which introduces ions of other elements in a material, and cross-section measurements, which discusses the cross-sectional dimensions of elementary hadron collisions. If you're not suited for research, there are companies that activate in this field. To learn more, we spoke with the CEO of Canberra Packard Romania, Radu Vasilake. But yeah, we have a square uh, directly on the face of the video. Uh, radiation detectors and radiation detection systems. What made you choose this career? Well, it's, it's a rather long story. When I was your age, I was participating in nuclear, uh, in the uh, physics uh, Olympiads, National Physics Olympiads. And didn't happen. So I turned researcher and after a while I got into the industry where I am now. So it was a choice because I like physics, in a nutshell. Uh, can you tell us more about what your company does for business? Yeah, sure. So um, we are oriented towards anything has to do something with what you might call ionizing radiation, radiation or nuclear radiation. Some people call it rather improperly. Uh, basically, this means that we can build and provide any kind of detector or radiation detection systems for any kind of application of, of nuclear physics, be it medical, be it industrial, be it energy or research. What is your message for the future generation? Uh, I think it can be summarized in, in just one sentence, go for what you like, go for what you want. Try to, try to do what you like, uh, because well, if you can't do what you like, uh, try to, to like what you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically uh, what I would try to, to convey is do not go into a certain field only for the money, it would make you miserable. If you do something that you like, the money will come later. And in my case, it was so. Okay, thank you. Is everything all right? Yes, um, there's always this, the beauty of being online and running the videos. Are you, uh, Diana and uh, Jonud, are you happy with the video or is it something that was um, missing? Uh, we had the picture at the end, but... Yeah, it was like a thank you for watching and I think, I believe in the middle when we, uh, did a transition to yeah. the interview which was us in the park again uh, doing that transition yeah there seemed to be a little bit of a glitch uh, right in the middle of the video yeah that was i don't know yeah. what happened maybe from the broadcasts yes i'm sorry probably is due to the broadcast and the streaming live uh, sometimes you know the connection makes not uh, exactly the best then also hosting the 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 event uh, the, uh, if you saw a square was just the 
posting chat. I had to reply to some participants. I'm sorry for that. It's all right, thank you. Um, okay, the way we questions? saw the, the more. So Emilia is momentaneously out because of lack of internet. Uh, so I run the uh, for now the, the, the competition. And so if there are some questions from the jury, please raise your hands up. And yeah, hello. Yes, Lizanne. I would like to congratulate you with your video. I think it was well prepared. Also the questions uh, you have prepared, uh, they, well, they were very good. So congratulations, congratulations on the video and on the preparation also for the presentation. This was really good. Also, your motivation was really uh, in-depth. So that's something is, which is well appreciated from my side. I would like to ask you, uh, are you now uh, looking forward to a career in nuclear and in, in which parts? Uh, I would like to work in research because, sorry. I was asking if I'd like to pursue a career in nuclear. Yes, yes. And what would you like to do specifically? I would like to do research, especially in the energy departments, because I would be interested in sort of improving the mechanism mm -hmm. which we use currently in order to produce an electric energy. Okay. Uh, me, on the other hand, I don't know. Uh, I Probably something to do with particles to uh, research as well, but something something a bit more in a way, uh, because uh, I personally, I want to explore to discover something. And uh, you know how that saying goes, we were born too late to explore the earth and uh, too early to explore the uni universe. So I would like to explore this, the atoms or the particles, okay. everything, you know? That's nice. So maybe you can uh, somehow in a way use the, the inspiration you've got from, uh, from this project. Congrats. Thank you. Are there any other question from the jury? So thank you to the Nakulsi team for your presentation and your video. A great applause for you. And then we are going on with the last team for today's presentation, the Nuclear Squad. Are you there? Uh, yes, we are here. You. Yes, that's okay. us. Perfect. So when you're ready, you can start your presentation. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, perfectly. Okay. So we named our team the Nuclear Squad. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Krull and my friend's name is Maximilian Bednosz. Uh, we are both uh, students uh, of second grade of high school in Poland. Um, we are both very interested in learning physics. My main field of interest is astronomy, but I uh, also find nuclear physics very interesting. Uh, and now Max. Yeah, well, my passion is also maths and physics and uh, yeah, nuclear has also fascinated me for quite some time now. So that's why we decided to participate, one of the reasons. So Poland is a medium-sized country located in Central Europe. Uh, it's a country of picturesque cities, sandy beaches, vast plains and uh, beautiful mountains. And um, our country unfortunately generates most of its energy with fossil fuel plants. And uh, we have one working research nuclear reactor in a city called Szpierg, but uh, it doesn't have any nuclear power plants yet though. And uh, to the town, we both live in Szczecin, which is one of the bigger cities in Poland. Uh, it has many beautiful buildings and parks, but also great historical value with uh, postal monuments and medieval style churches. And uh, the city itself is very open minded and constantly developing. Uh, now I would like to play a video about our school. Um, I hope you will be able to hear us. Hello. 
Sorry, Kirstof, we cannot hear the audio of the video. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat? We, we cannot hear the audio from the video of your presentation, um, sorry. Okay, I, I think now you should be able to hear us. This is our school. Yes, now it's okay, thank you. It's one of leading ones in Poland. It prepares students for Matura exams and Olympiads very well. We like attending this school because the atmosphere is friendly, the teachers are encouraging and helpful, and it just allows us to develop new skills and expand our knowledge greatly. This is our favorite part of it, the physics laboratory. Here pupils can conduct many experiments using various instruments, such as these digital oscilloscopes, this Van de Graaff generator, or this magnetic compass. We think it gives great opportunity for everyone to kind of experience physics itself through experimenting. And uh, now back to the presentation. What we have learned about nuclear sciences in school. So we haven't learned uh, very much about uh, the nuclear technology and uh, how nuclear power plants work itself in school, but uh, we have learned uh, really a lot about uh, generally the nuclear science and nuclear physics, mostly about radioactive decay, radioactivity, ionizing radiation, fission and fusion. However, we think that uh, the general knowledge acquired uh, in schools is in, about this field is really limited and should be uh, broadened. Our motivation is that uh, we believe people aren't taught enough about nuclear technology in schools and that leads to many myths and fake information forming about this sector. We want to spread awareness and overcome myths about nuclear. We are convinced that to achieve climatic goals we need to use fusion and fusion technologies as a greener alternative to fossil fuel power plants and uh, that we should start building more nuclear reactors instead of closing them. And uh, that is the entirety of our presentation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Krzysztof. Uh, very well. So now I'm back with <laughs> a bit more stable internet, I hope. Uh, so now I would like to invite all of you to watch your video. Hello there, look at these 100 coins. If we had this amount of uranium ore, we would be able to extract from that one coin of pure uranium. Now, used as a nuclear fuel, it would generate the same amount of heat as 10 of these 2.5 kilogram bags of coal. As you can imagine, it greatly reduces the waste emission. So, how do nuclear power plants work? And how do they compare to other sources of electricity? Glad you asked. Nuclear reactors are based on radioactive isotope chain reaction. It's being bombarded with neutrons and most of the time it splits into lighter elements and free neutrons, whilst emitting energy as thermal radiation. These free neutrons hit other molecules, causing a closely controlled self-sustaining reaction, which requires a use of a moderator. It is completely different than the one in atomic bomb, in which reaction is immediate and uncontrolled. Nuclear reactors can be divided by the moderator used. There are three main types. In light water reactor, it is water, which may be later used to power a turbine. Water is the cheapest moderator, but not the safest nor the most efficient one, as it requires enriched uranium. However, more than 80% of nuclear reactors are light water reactors. Other two types are heavy water and graphite moderated reactors. Heavy water is a particle composed of two deuterium molecules and one oxygen molecule, and graphite is a form of coal mainly used in pencils. Both of them tend to be more thoroughly thermalized than the light water reactor. Due to this fact, they can use natural, unenriched uranium, which makes them a better choice. Now let's talk about waste management. The whole waste, such as uranium and plutonium, is being safely stored mainly deep under the reactor. 
Nuclear is the only energetic sector that takes whole responsibility for produced waste. The smoke emitted by nuclear plants is simply steam, which isn't radioactive. What about the radiation? Well, it is negligible and constantly monitored. Typically, a smoker receives 2,500 times more ionizing radiation than a person living within 80 kilometers from the reactor. In terms of safety, nuclear causes only 90 deaths per trillion kilowatt hour, with Chernobyl and Fukushima being the only major fatal accidents. The coal, which is perceived a safe alternative for nuclear, is the most dangerous, causing even 100,000 deaths to produce the same amount of energy. What about greenhouse gases emission? Nuclear is one of the cleanest sources of energy, generating slightly more greenhouse gases than wind turbines and hydropower plants. One and a half times less than solar photovoltaic, and finally 10 up to 20 times less than fossil fuel plants. Unfortunately, the greenest ways to produce electricity are not available for every country. Wind turbines require a whole lot of space and most importantly fast and regular winds. Hydropower plants require vast and fast flowing rivers, and some countries are not able to meet these conditions, and the alternative for them is nuclear. So why don't we just focus on renewables and nuclear power plants? Well, unfortunately, nuclear reactors are very expensive, reaching the cost of billions of dollars and taking quite time to build, usually from five years to even decades. Therefore, it takes them a long time to become profitable, and that discourages many countries from investing in them. Apart from that, they cause significant social resistance and many protests. That's very unfortunate, as we have to start caring about greenhouse gases emission to stop the global warming. Hopefully, we will start building nuclear reactors in Europe instead of closing them. What's also worth mentioning is that nuclear reactors technology is being constantly improved, and thorium reactor may become a new and efficient way to acquire energy. It uses thorium to produce uranium-233 isotope, which has several advantages over uranium nuclear reactor, such as greater abundance of thorium on Earth, less radioactive waste, superior physical and nuclear fuel properties, and lack of easy weaponization. To sum up, nuclear energy may be the way to the green future. Thank you very much, Krzysztof and Maximilian. Um, so now we have time to watch, um, so I mean, to, to, for the questions of jury. Um, I hope there are many. Hello, yeah, I'd like to, to, to ask one. Well, congratulations on the presentation and the, and the video. Many thanks for, for the effort that uh, you clearly put into it. Um, and you mentioned something that I think is, is uh, important, which uh, in your presentation uh, for the need to overcome myths. So I think we can all agree that, that you know, the nuclear sector is surrounded by, by quite a lot of myths. And I would like to ask you, what do you think is the best way to overcome these myths that, uh, that kind of has spread around uh, society? What do you think is the best way to try and reduce the myth? Well, for sure, um, uh, talking with people that have like lack of knowledge, such as knowing like, those things, and um, maybe projects such as this one definitely express the awareness. And well, maybe also the videos that we also all all of us did, because I think that. Um, once uh, a video like this pops in your YouTube recommendation, you just watch it and well, you know that apparently you were wrong and uh, that nuclear is the future. Thank you. Thank you, Maximilian. Krzysztof, would you like to add something to this? Yes, I also believe that uh, something that should change is more uh, learning uh, more in school while in school about nuclear because most people come out of the education system with basically no knowledge about how nuclear power plants work and uh, how they differ from an atomic bomb uh, which is uh, oftentimes confused so uh, i believe that more education is also needed fantastic very valuable comment i think I guess you, you agree. Oh, yeah. 
I, I can't agree more because that was exactly what you described. That's exactly what happened to me. I went out of school with, with uh, you know, thinking thinking exactly what what you said, and it took for me a while to, you know, to to deep to learn more about it and and know that that my perception was actually an incorrect one. So very valuable comment. I agree, Amelia. Thank you very much. I think this is also a role for Anna itself to uh, to talk about education and what is the also the program at schools, how it should be um, uh, maybe uh, added to the, about the nuclear uh, energy as such into the, the schools at the secondary school levels. I think this is what we are, what we need on the European level, and this is the role of and then to advocate it, advocate uh, about it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now we are uh, at the final point of the competition of Wednesday after nuclear squat. We have now a short break, 15 minutes time to grab something to drink. And uh, we are back a quarter past three with a medical physics presentation from uh, Caruana. Caruana. Carmel Caruana. Hello, Carmel, you are already okay. with us. Okay. Can so, I, may I ask you whether you can hear me, please? We hear you very well, Carmel. Super. Okay, see you in 15 minutes, in uh, 13 minutes. <laughs>
Hello, Emilia. Hello, hello. Welcome back from, from the coffee break. Okay, can you hear me, Emilia? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay. Shall I share my screen now with the PowerPoint to check? Just, just a second. Just a second. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. you, can, you, can, you can do it now just for a test, please. Just for a test. Okay. Everyone, are you still with us? <clears throat> okay. Is it there? Okay, let's have it on full screen. So, can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes, I see it very well then. Okay, super. Great. Oh, you can so, keep this now. Uh, so, just to welcome back after the short coffee break. So, now, I have a pleasure to invite you to the lecture of Carmel Caruana, Dr. Carmel G. Caruana from Malta on medical physics, uh, professor and head medical physics department from University of Malta. Uh, he's also the pastor of EFMONT, education training representatives for the European guidelines on the MPE, MedRapid and more. Maybe it's okay, Amelia, don't, don't, don't read it all because it's, they are young people. <laughs> you they just want to hear. All the abbreviations. Thank you very much and uh, have fun. Okay, thank you, Amelia. Uh, thank you, Amelia, and thank you, Silla, for the invitation. Okay, guys, I would like to tell you a bit about medical physics today. I'm sure you have heard that there are people called medical physicists that can work in hospitals, that can work in industry and the medical equipment industry, that can work in research. But today I'm going to focus on what medical physicists do in hospitals. I'm sure that you know that there, you have heard a bit that medical physicists are involved with x-rays, for example, or perhaps nuclear medicine, okay? And you have heard a lot, perhaps a bit of cancer treatment. You have heard of even yesterday on medical imaging. But today I would like to give you an idea. What is the essential thing that we do in, in, in medicine, in healthcare, in hospitals? Why are we there? Why are medical physicists there? Why does society employ medical physicists, pay them a lot of money? Okay, why do they do it? Let's have a look. Hospitals, let's start with this important, very important declaration here. Hospitals are full of very sophisticated physics-based equipment. Now, what do we mean exactly by this? Because it's a sentence like that. Why the word sophisticated there, for example? Why is it that um, the medical equipment in hospital is so expensive? For example, a CT scanner, over a million euros. An MRI, close to 2 million euros. Why is it so expensive? Why is it sophisticated? The reason is that with medical equipment, you're not taking readings or data in a lab measuring on magnets or electric circuits, you're taking measurements on people, okay? So the equipment has to be very good. Why does it have to be very good? Because if the measurement is not accurate and it's not precise, that patient can, can have a cancer, for example, you don't see it because the equipment is perhaps not working as it should. Perhaps it hasn't been set up properly as it should. So the patient has a cancer, you get an image, an X-ray image, say, and you don't see it, it's not there. Then we realize that the patient has a cancer, say one year after, it's too late. This cancer has spread all over the body and we can't do anything about it. So why is the equipment sophisticated? Because it saves lives. And all this equipment is physics-based. So let me give you an overview first, a big, quick survey of what equipment we have in hospital, some of it. The first one is called diagnostic and interventional radiology. Some people call it medical imaging. It's the same, AKA, also known as medical imaging. What is this? 
This helps us look inside the body without opening it up. For example, you can have a patient who ha perhaps has problems with his heart, with one of the valves in his heart. The heart is a pump. Now, you can easily check what's wrong with the patient easily. I mean, you can put him on a surgery table. You can put him to sleep, okay? Give him anesthesia. It's called general anesthesia. Then start cutting here, okay, through the skin, through the ribs, move the ribs, move the lungs a bit out of the way, perhaps find the heart and open up the heart and check what is wrong with the heart. The problem is that by the time that you do that, that the patient is dead. Because he has already has heart trouble. If you, you put him through that procedure, he will die. So you need to see what is wrong with the patient without opening up the body. And this is medical imaging. You will use this even in industry, even in the nuclear industry. It's called non-destructive testing. You want to check something without destroying it. Okay. Let's have a look at these, some of these imaging modalities. The first one is projection radiography, X-ray images. You have seen, I'm sure, a lot of these. Okay. These are 2D images. You know, we have an X-ray tube here. The patient can stay here or can even stand up here. There's an X-ray detector here below the patient. X-rays pass through the patient, fall on detector. Okay, and they produce this kind of images, fantastic images, but not very good. There are much better images that you can produce than this. Or perhaps you've heard of a CT scanner. Okay, a CT scanner, which produces 3D images. You have a patient here. You have an X-ray tube now, which is not in one position. These are the X-ray detectors. Okay, X-rays passing through the patient and falling on the detectors. But the tube is not in one position, but it goes around the patient like that. So we can see the patient from all angles. If you can see the patient from all angles, you can produce 3D images of the patient. Okay, and the images are much better, look, can you see? And moreover, you can see in any direction inside the body, not just in one direction, but in any direction that you want. So the, this is the CT scanner, look when it's open, this is when it's closed here, and this is when it's opening up. This is a friend of mine from Holland, okay? Can you see you have the X, Y, and Z axis, the surrounding here is the center here through which the patient moves. The patient move like that, okay? So the patient will move along the Z axis here, like that, whilst the X-ray tube rotates like this in the XY plane. And if you want to see uh, um, a video of this, go to YouTube over here and you will see the actual tube rotating like that. It's, don't think it rotates slowly like that. Huh? It rotates quite fast very fast. So it rotates like that very fast while the patient moves under it like that. Huh? And you produce a 3D image of from here, say, to here, okay, of a whole slab of the body. Another type of imaging modality, it's also 3D. It's ultrasound. I'm sure you have seen images like these of babies. Eh? This is the type of machine you find in hospital. It's a very sophisticated machine again. Today, we can make them very small. In fact, these were invented by the army, okay, because obviously you can't take this when you're in the middle of a battlefield. So they invented small ones. Today, even doctors, your family doctor might even buy one of this and actually do ultrasound in even your house. Okay, if he comes to visit you in your house, you can check your heart with this. And we can also print with 3D printing. Look at that, yeah? okay. Magnetic resonance imaging, another imaging modality, okay, which here uses a very strong, it looks like a CT scanner, but it's very, very diff different inside. Inside it's made, there's a very, very strong magnet. Okay, I'll show you how strong it is in a moment. So the patient is actually put this strong magnet here. There's a magnetic field. And we actually, what we do is we magnetize the patient. Okay, because the patient, you know, our body is made, there's a lot of water in it. And the hydrogen nucleus is slightly, slightly magnetic. It has a small magnetic dipole. 
So we can actually magnetize the patient, okay? Magnetize the body. And by taking measurements of the magnetism of the body, we can produce images like this. Look, look how detailed it is. Huh? This is the brain, look, even these, huh? even this, the hind brain, look, the part of the brain at the top, mouth, the mouth, the tongue, look, huh? look how detailed the images are. Look how strong the magnetic field is. Okay, if this is an actual accident that happened. Guy came in with a, with a metal cylinder. It took, it, it, it took the metal cylinder with the, pay, with the person with it. Okay, look what it does. The magnetic field here uses from 1.5 to 3 Tesla. Now we might say, those of you who don't know magnetic magnetism a lot, but it's not high, right? Three, oh, it's high. 3 Tesla is a very large magnitude. It's 60,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. 60,000, eh? not 6,000, 60,000. We use a superconducting magnet, okay, in liquid helium because it has to be maintained in liquid helium so that it keeps this very strong magnetism. And geography. This is another fantastic piece of imaging. Look, to see the arteries and veins inside without opening up again. Look at these, the arteries and veins of the brain. This is the brain here, okay? Full of very small arteries and, brain and, uh, and veins, look at that, okay? And you can do it with X-ray imaging. For example, this, look, can you see? These are the kidneys. Kidneys are very important for us because they clean our blood. The blood has to pass through the kidneys and it's cleaned so that it can be reused properly. Huh? Again, here you can see the kidneys. Can you see the kidneys over here? One and two. And you can see all the arteries, even down to the veins, down to the feet. Huh? Can you see? Nuclear medicine. So what is nuclear medicine now? I will give you an idea why nuclear medicine is important. First of all, nuclear medicine uses radioactive materials. So we take a very small amount of radioactive tracers and we inject them inside the patient. Extremely small, huh? not, uh, not something to worry about, very, very small. But what does it do? Why, why do we use it? Why do we inject? Let's look at that. I'll go back a bit. Can you see the kidneys here? These were imaged, say, by the CT scanner. And their image also here with this CT scanner. The kidneys look okay. Can you see? They are the same. You don't have one which is enlarged, for example. This is how we do with kidneys. We compare the two kidneys. Are they approximately the same? Is there one which is enlarged? There's enlarged as a problem. But they are the same, so they look perfect. Even here, they look perfect. So the structure of the kidneys can look you can image it with CT, with ultrasound, with MRI, and it will look totally normal. Yet, one of the kidneys, perhaps, is not filtering blood. So the structure, the shape is okay, but the function for what it is, the kidneys are there, the function of the kidneys to clean the blood, is not working, okay? And that you can't check properly with CT or MRI, there, the best way of checking it is by injecting slightly radioactive materials. So use of radioactive materials to check whether organs are functioning properly. Sometimes you also use it for killing some cancers. Okay, so we inject radioactive material that goes into the cancer and actually kills it. Uh, that means beta or even alpha these days and actually kills it. Okay, this is called nuclear medicine. In nuclear medicine, we use a gamma camera because the radio nuclides that we inject, they give off gamma rays. Huh? So it's a gamma camera, look. If you leave it in one position only, it's called gamma camera. If you rotate it like a patient like this, it is called SPECT, S-P-E-C-T, okay? And today we also use other um, image, other radionuclides, which give off positrons, okay? Give off positrons. And we have something called PET, which is positron emission tomography. 
Okay, it's a very, very powerful technique. And we use it in conjunction with CT or even with MRI. Look at some of these pictures, for example, here. And you see, this is an image of the MRI of the brain. We can see the brain, I mean, the structure, but is it working properly? Are all areas of the brain functioning properly? So there we have to use nuclear medicine also. We have to use PET. So this is the image of PET here. This is the image of MRI, which shows us the shape and the structure of the brain. This is the PET image from nuclear medicine, which shows us which parts of the brain are functioning properly and which are not. And you can put them even one on top of each other. That's why it's often called PET CT. You put them on top of each other, so you can see both the structure, the shape, and also the functioning at the same time. Yeah? There are a lot of these these days with fantastic software. Look. Okay. This is one of my ex students. She's now working in with PET CT in hospital. Finally, let's look at radiation oncology, which is the use of uh, um, either X-ray beams or electron beams or proton beams today, or even radioactive sources to kill cancer in this case. Okay, we want it to kill cancer. Okay, some people call it radiotherapy yeah? or radiation oncology. Radiotherapy mean the same thing. Oncology, by the way, is the medical term for the study of cancer. Yeah? This is a, so we use linear accelerators. They are called for producing the X-ray and the electron beams. Again, this is an ex-student of mine. Now she's working in hospital. She's doing measurements on the linear accelerator here. Let me see. Today we even use proton accelerators and we use proton beams, okay? Proton beams have a, a very major advantage on X-ray beams because you can pinpoint sort of the beam more on the cancer itself, okay? You try to hit the cancer itself without hitting the surrounding, okay? Because this is what you want to do in radiotherapy. You want to kill, to hit the cancer cells without hitting the surrounding a, a body which is still healthy. You just want to kill the cancer, but not kill the healthy parts of the body. This is called optimizing the radiation therapy. Okay. Sometimes we put small radioactive sources inside the cancer itself. Okay. So sometimes if we can, if it is possible, we take a small radioactive source and put it inside the cancer so that it irradiates the, the cancer and kills the cancer cells. The radiation kills the cancer cells. So hospitals are full of super sophisticated software also, not just equipment, even software. Look at this, 3D imaging. Eh? And you see the kidneys eh? with all the details, with all the veins and the arteries coming out of them, okay. This is called radiotherapy planning software, okay, which medical physicists use a lot to plan to make sure that when we send the radiation in, we hit the cancer cells, eh, but not the surrounding tissues as much as possible. Optimizing, this is called optimizing radiotherapy. Eh? Now, let me tell you something about why we are there. Why is the medical, medical physics profession there? Listen to this properly here, this argument. Hospitals are full of high-tech medical equipment and software, which is all physics and mathematics based. The mathematics of MRI, for example, the physics and the mathematics of MRI is super difficult. It's extremely difficult. Even those with a final year of BSc or even a master's and master's in physics find it difficult to understand, okay? Medical equipment is a major investment of the healthcare system. A CT scanner, as I said before, costs over a million euros. So every year, every country spends hundreds of millions of euros buying new equipment, okay? Yet, and this is the problem, 
Yet, medical doctors and other healthcare professionals have insufficient knowledge of physics to use the equipment to its full capacity. Many of them have practically zero knowledge of physics, almost zero knowledge of physics. So they cannot use the equipment to its full capacity and in a safe manner. And the situation is getting worse because the technology is moving ahead all the time and their knowledge of physics is lagging and lagging behind. So we have a very large contradiction in hospitals. We have the most sophisticated equipment, often the most sophisticated in a country. Fantastic uh, physics in it, very advanced physics and mathematics. And yet the people who are using it don't know any physics or know very little physics. And this is why medical physicists are required by EU law. Look at this diagram. Medical physicists are a bridge between the medical equipment industry and research literature, which is full of physics, a lot of physics. And these people here who are going to use the equipment or have the equipment used on them or hospital management who need to buy the equipment and know practically no physics at all. And this is why we are there. We need to bridge this gap here. We are a bridge building profession. We have one foot. A medical physicist has one foot in the equipment and the other foot in healthcare. Okay. We need to know physics and mathematics and ICT, and we need to know anatomy, physiology, etc. In medical physics, you learn both physics itself and its medical applications. You use your physics knowledge for solving real world challenges in improving the health and well being of people. So it has both a scientific and social value. You're not only there doing physics okay, and mathematics, but you're using your physics to save lives. Like in the case of nuclear energy, we use physics to support to provide energy to society, without which even hospitals will not <laughs> function. Eh? So nuclear energy is also important, okay? Because otherwise we won't be able to operate our, our linear accelerators if we don't provide us with, with the energy. So every, everybody's useful in this world. But with medical physics, you save lives daily. Eh? You learn about some of the most sophisticated equipment and software used in clinical medicine. You involve yourself in interesting and challenging work. It never becomes boring as healthcare technology is continuously evolving. Whilst I'm talking to you now at the moment, I can assure you that Siemens and Philips and GE are planning to put out new versions of their MRI, okay? New versions of, your, of their CT. You will learn how healthcare technology is used to take care of your own health and that of your family and friends. One of the big advantages of medical physics, I see it, that it helps you learn to take care of yourself, okay, your own health, and also the health of your own family and, and friends. I will tell you a bit about the BSc that I, I am doing in Malta at the moment. It's a new BSc because I have been involved in medical physics education now for 25 years all over the world. And um, I started a new experimental BSc for, for Purdue, which I consider to be the, the, for producing the medical physicists of the future. It's a four year course. It's a BSc in physics, medical physics and radiation protection. So you have all the three in one course. It consists of five strands Okay, the first strand is physics, mathematics, statistics, and ICT because you need to be a good physicist and mathematician to be able to become a good medical physicist. Then you need to know anatomy, physiology, and pathology, and we you studied this. So my students go with they go in the same lectures as the physicists huh, to learn the mathematics and physics, and then they go in the same lectures with radiographers and physiotherapists to learn the anatomy and physiology and pathology. In this way, they learn to, to um, relate to the other healthcare professions and they find in hospital, get, they make friends from the other professions. Then obviously we have medical physics and radiation protection, particularly in the final year, we have a lot. Then we have 
336 hours of hospital placement. So we, they spend 336 hours in hospitals with the medical physicists who work in the hospital to start getting used to working in a hospital and learning about the equipment and learning to work with other healthcare professions. And finally, of course, research. Those who go into medical physics, because with the course you can keep, go on with physics if you want to, or you go on with medical physics or radiation protection if you want to. I prepare them for all of them, even for radiation protection in nuclear if they, if they want to. And I'm trying to provide uh, a BSc for, so that people at the end can do a lot of things. Those who do, want to go for medical physics, they do a master's, in, a one-year master's in medical physics. Those who want to do on nuclear access, they can go abroad because we don't have it, unfortunately, in Malta, the country is too, is too small. Um, but I might do radiation protection later on, but at this time, because I don't have time at the moment. Um, but I encourage them to go abroad and even go into the nuclear industry in Europe, because it's a good job also. Look at this, since physics and mathematics students don't have biology, we organize an online pre-course summer school on anatomy and physiology specifically for them, and it's very popular. I told you here that our students go for anatomy, physiology, and pathology with the other healthcare professions, with, okay, with the radiographers, physiotherapists, etc. But these would have had biology. They wouldn't have mathematics and some very little physics but they would have had biology. So what I do, those who apply for the bachelor's, before they start the bachelor during summer, we do an easygoing course on anatomy and physiology and pathology. We don't do all bi biology. We, don't, we only do the biology necessary for our course. Otherwise, it's not possible. And uh, the students, in fact, uh, it's totally online. So the, even if they're on holiday in summer or I am on holiday, we can do it from anywhere. And they enjoy it a lot because the physics and mathematics students enjoy learning a bit of, of anatomy and physiology. So they were very, very well prepared. And in fact, they're very, they're doing extremely well. They're doing extremely well, even the anatomy and physiology. I, I was in fact very impressed with them. I congratulated them on that. So maybe if any of you who might not have a course on and medical physics and radiation protection and bachelors in, in, in your country and you would like to do it, you can come to Malta. The, for European people, the course is free, okay? Um, finally, some information, if you want more information on medical physics, the IAEA provides a lot of free information about medical physics. And just in case you thought that medical physics was only for people, eh? Okay, there are many people who make a lot of money imaging race horses, by the way, race horses, they make a lot of money imaging race horses these days. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carmel. Uh, that was very interesting presentation. Thank you. I can speak for myself that I really regret not studying medical physics after your presentation. It is, uh... everything, everything is interesting in life. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to invite now all our students to put some questions to you. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, just to change maybe the mode of speaking. So who has a question, please? By the way, if you, can, if you want to have a question, if any, any questions you can write to me, there's the email address there, feel free. Yeah? All the students can write to me. To put ANN on top, okay, so that I will know who you are in the email header, otherwise I wouldn't know. Come on, there's somebody, Nicole, 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 Nicole team. put up their hand or is it a mistake? But, no, no, I wanted to ask a question. Oh, please go ahead then. Um, just how advanced is the mathematical and physics class? Like, no. how advanced are the, is the math and the physics? No, in... you will, in, in the course, uh, for medical yes. physics, you need to be, you, have, you need to have as good a grounding of physics as any physics student, even those who are doing just physics. You will not need to do, for example, astrophysics, 
Okay, <laughs> all right, you won't need to do that, but you need to do quantum theory, you need to do gravitation because there's a lot of mathematics which we use in MRI in gravitation. You will not believe that, okay? For example, MRI is full of tensors, okay? It's very strong electromagnetism and very good tensors. CT, we use something called the radon transform, for example, okay? Um, uh, so the amount of physics is the same. But we don't, we don't do, in my course at least, we don't do then the, um, the applications like astrophysics, but you do everything, yeah? relativity, because accelerators involve relativity. And we do nuclear and particle, because we, in nuclear medicine, we use a lot of radionuclides. And if you go to cyclotrons, you need to know how, how, how they are, uh, how cyclotron therapy, you need to know how they work and how to adjust the beam so that you can actually produce a good service for the patient. So in terms of physics, you will need to, the normal physics, you need to know it as much as, as, the, as the physics people. And in fact, you go into the same, in my course, you go to the same um, um, uh, lectures as them. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any further question? Last question to Carmel. Uh, there's a question from MNP Martin Arturo. Which is the best exam between magnetic resonance and PET? Which is the best exam? Exam. Okay, examination of the body. We mean. Okay. I right. guess. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think. It's not the best, uh, which is the best of those two, whether MRI or PET, for example. You, first of all, there is not best because MRI has very advantages in one thing, okay? Why, for example, to image the brain, the MRI super is the best. But then if you want to check whether the brain is working properly or whether, for example, if I make a noise like that, which part of the brain is triggered, okay? There I have to use PET. So notice, so the, uh, the different modalities have a different, um, have different advantages and disadvantages. X-rays and CT have the disadvantage, for example, that they can, they use X-rays and X-rays can produce cancer if not used wisely, okay? If used wisely, everything is okay. But then they are super, they are very good imaging modalities. I mean, in our hospital, we save lives every day with our CT scanner. There's a, a car accident, the first thing, whoa, CT scanner gives us an image of the whole body in less than a minute, okay? And MRI cannot do that. It will need half an hour to do it, <laughs> okay? So every, every machine has its advantage that disadvantages and this is what a medical physicist must be good at he must know all the imaging modalities all the physics of each so he can say look for this particular medical situation this would be the best this would be mri would be better than ct or ct better than mri okay you need all these two these are tools different tools and you choose the best tool for what you need at that point in time eh? for the pa what the patient needs I think uh, we, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are, thank you very much, Karma. It was uh, very interesting and I hope that all the students enjoyed it as well. Uh, so there are definitely some of you who uh, are convinced now to study uh, medical physics after your uh, I hope so, because we need a lot. <laughs> there, we, there, we need about 40,000 for the next 20 years, about 40,000, the world needs about 40,000 more medical physicists. Where they're coming, we don't know, <laughs> we don't know. So jobs are there, guys. That's a very important message. Thank you very much, Carmel. Okay, now I would like to invite Dr. Gergo Poko from Budapest to share his screen uh, and present us his presentation, Nuclear Fusion. It's another interesting topic. A lot of uh, students are also interested in fusion. And we are also, as a nuclear sector, looking at this, at the projects at ITER, for example. So um, yeah, I would like to invite Dr. Poco to share the screen and start the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amelia. And uh, well, uh, warm greetings from a hot office in Budapest. Uh, I'm at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, and uh, uh, well, I do research in, in fusion plasma physics. So 
uh, I will talk now about my favorite topic. Um, well, how to make fusion, that's the title. And uh, of course, uh, we are in a nuclear competition. So I'm not talking about fusion kitchen or, or fusion music or something like that, but, uh, but nuclear fusion. And uh, well, before proceeding to how to make fusion, I would just very quickly like to address the question of why on earth we would like to do fusion. Uh, and uh, of course, we would like to produce electricity. We, we, we are crazy about electricity. I mean, how, how much we need electricity is really well seen when, when we lack it, when, when there is a disruption in the electricity grid. So uh, I assume that uh, this will not change soon. So we will need to find a way to produce electricity in a way that uh, we have abundant fuel. It's clean, we are not destroying our environment. It's safe and it's controlled so that we can put into the grid as much as it's needed. And uh, well, fission is uh, not bad about satisfying these criteria, but there are shortcomings. And there are shortcomings with every other type of energy production that we know now. And uh, well, there is a hope that uh, fusion might be ideal for these purposes. Um, I will not go into very much detail about uh, this slide. Of course, we could talk about ages and I kind of urge you as, I mean, you are a new generation, think, think a lot about uh, uh, how, how to uh, uh, produce electricity in a, in a, in a uh, sustainable way, because it's, it's for you uh, that we would like to sustain this whole thing. But I will, I will now concentrate on, on fusion so that we understand why we really would like to have it. And well, this is, this is the basis for, for all uh, nuclear energy production graphs. So this is the, the binding energy of the nucleus divided by atomic mass. So it's a specific binding energy. And it's plotted as, as, a, as the atomic mass of the nucleus. And well, you probably know that uh, iron is, is one of the most stable uh, isotopes and uh, iron 56. And uh, if we approach this from either direction, we can gain energy. Well, of course, there's a slight trick that the, the x-axis is logarithmic. So just to emphasize the great potential in fusion. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's a very common figure. And, and what's really common nowadays is to produce energy from crazy heavy uh, isotopes by splitting these to, well, mid-heavy isotopes. That's uh, nuclear fission, and that's what's happening in most nuclear power plants. Uh, but as you see, there is even a little bit greater potential in uh, gaining energy from fusion. Um, and if we concentrate into the beginning of this graph, we can see that there's a huge drop here from the hydrogen one isotope, which is just a proton. So by definition, it has no binding energy because it has nothing to bind to, to helium four, which is a very nice symmetric nucleus with two protons, two neutrons, and it's very stable. So if we would like to produce energy from fusion, maybe we should aim for helium-4. And, and we can do it by fusing something that's lighter than helium-4. And well, actually, we've seen fusion happen. I mean, uh, you probably know also that, that fusion is, is what's fueling the sun. So um, it's, it works perfectly. Uh, in the sun, the fuel of the sun is the, the hydrogen one isotope, which is just a pure proton. And after a few steps, the end product is helium four. And in helium four, we have two protons and two neutrons. So you can see that it doesn't really add up. 
uh, you have you have four protons and at the end you produce two two protons and two neutrons so there is some kind of trick that's happening and the trick is that the sun uses uh, mostly a three stage process and in the very first stage one of the protons just changes to a neutron by emitting a, a positron and a, and a neutrino and well, it happens and it works perfectly. Um, well, in the center of the sun at, uh, one, uh, at, at 10 million degrees, around 10 or 15 million degrees of Celsius or Kelvin, well, actually it doesn't matter. This uh, reaction continues in more or less a steady state and, and it, it produces lots of energy. Um, the great thing about fusion is that it produces about 10 million times more energy than uh, the, the, the chemical reactions, uh, for example, when we burn something. So it's, it's really, really fuel efficient. The thing about the sun is that it burns for about 10 billion years. So it's, it's quite a lot and well, on one hand, we are lucky because it gave us enough time to uh, develop from microbes and uh, uh, have video conferences and, and learn about fusion. Uh, yet, if we would like to burn something on, on, on the Earth, probably we would like it to burn a little bit faster than 10 billion years. And the trick to do is to use a fuel that already has neutrons ready, okay? So that we don't need to produce neutrons because that's, that's what takes a lot of time. And this is a, this is a reaction. It uses uh, two heavy isotopes of hydrogen. So in deuterium, we have one proton and one neutron. And in tritium, we have uh, one proton and two neutrons. And in one step, these can produce helium-4 and also one neutron remains. So that's, that's an extra product. And the good news is that it can go really quick. Well, I wrote it 10 seconds, but that's, that's the more uh, peaceful version that I'm working with. But uh, if, you, if you do it in an H-bomb, it can go in nanoseconds. Um, you need slightly higher temperature for it to be very effective, about uh, 100 million uh, degrees of, of, of Celsius, but it, it, uh, it should work, it should work. Okay, but let's go into a little bit more detail here. I mean, this is the, the DT reaction. I mean, these, these are the, the uh, reacting uh, uh, isotopes, deuterium and tritium, and what comes out is helium-4 and neutron. But I mean, there are other types of reactions that we might consider. The only reason to go for DT reaction is that it's the easiest to achieve on Earth. So the likelihood of the reaction is way higher than the likelihood of other reactions. And the, the, the energy, the collision energy that we, we need for this is also way lower. I mean, these are both logarithmic scales. So this is, this is very significant. But with DT reaction, we have a bit of a problem. I mean, deuterium is very common. I mean, uh, it's, it's a plenty of deuterium in, in, in uh, seawater, so it's, it's not, not even expensive. Tritium, however, is, uh, is unstable. It just has too many neutrons for that single proton. So it, it tends to decay to helium-3 uh, and the half-life is just above 12 years, so it's, it's quite low. And um, for this reason, on the whole Earth, we have only about 100 kilogram of tritium. So even if it's very efficiently producing energy, so in, in a huge re gigawatt reactor, you would only need less than one kilogram of tritium a day, uh, Still, I mean, it, we would run, run out of it quite quickly. And what gives us still hope is that 
V in the reaction have a high energy neutron, which flies out of the, the quite rare mixture of, of tritium and deuterium and helium. I mean, it's, it doesn't have a charge, so it, it's not interacting that heavily. Flies into the wall of the machine, and if there's lots of lithium in there, it can react with lithium, and lithium falls apart to helium-4 and tritium. Okay, so at the end of the day, the fuel of your machine is lithium and deuterium, and, and both are abundant on Earth. Um, what I particularly love about this reaction is that neither the DT fusion nor the lithium separation to tritium and helium produces any radioactive products. Okay, helium-4 is, is stable like hell. So that's, that's why we are producing that. That's, that's, uh, that's what's used in, in kindergarten to, to just uh, 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 blow into balloons. So it would be like, like a dream to, to produce helium-4 and lots of energy. Um, but let's go a bit further. And I mean, this, this place is kind of tricky because for, even for DT reaction, we need about 100 million degrees of Celsius. And uh, that's uh, way, way higher than we are used to. I mean, it's, it's 10 times uh, higher temperature than it's in the center of the sun. So we are speaking about the hottest points in the, in the solar system here. And uh, this is where plasma physics comes in. Because if you heat a gas a lot, then the collisions become so intense between the gas particles that they just tear off electrons. So at the end, you have lots of free electrons and free ions. And that's what we call a plasma. And most of the visible material in the universe is in plasma state, but in Earth, we are living in a very dense and cold environment that allows uh, such beautiful molecules and, and structures from molecules to, to develop like, like humans. So plasma is underrepresented here on Earth. We need to, need it to learn how to deal with it. And the first problem with a hot plasma is that uh, how do you confine it? I mean, you cannot just put it into a bottle. The bottle would immediately vaporize and the plasma would cool down. The only way you can stably confine such a plasma is through magnetic fields. Because in a plasma, you have just charged particles and charged particles have a very curious way of interacting with magnetic fields through the Lorentz force. A Lorentz force is perpendicular to both the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field. So at, at the end, the Lorentz force ends up not, not changing the magnitude of the velocity, but it definitely changes its direction. And, and at the end of the day, your particles end up spiraling around the magnetic field lines. So if you can make a magnetic geometry where the magnetic field lines don't leave your machine, you have a chance to confine your plasma in it so that those don't leave the field. And you can do it with a helically wind magnetic field structure. And uh, this structure is, is very good in confining magnetic fields. This is a simulation. I mean, I won't prove it mathematically now, but this is a simulation showing a, 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 a orbit of a charged particle, an ion actually, going around in a torus with a toroidal magnetic field. And there are lots of things happening with it. I mean, you're heating it, it changes directions and whatever. What it cannot do is that it cannot leave the machine. It never reaches the, the the edges of the machine. So that's, that's the, the way how we confine the plasma magnetically. And there are two types of machines that can do that. One is a tokamak, that's a Soviet invention from the 50s. It's toroidalnaya kamerasnya, maya nyitmika tyushkami. Well, if, if you speak Russian, any of you, you might be laughing now. But anyway, um, 
this is just toroidal chamber with uh, uh, with magnetic field coils. So that's a practical name. Nice symmetric machine with a huge transformer coil somewhere, which drives a current in the plasma. Because I mean, there are free charges in the plasma, so you can easily drive a current in it. And the current produces a magnetic field. So in a tokamak, you use the magnetic field of the plasma itself added to an externally produced toroidal magnetic field to produce this helically wind toroidal magnetic structure. The stellarator is an American invention from the 60s and it produces uh, the same magnetic field geometry by external helically winding coils. So it's not a helically symmetric machine. And it doesn't have a central solenoid. So that's, that's how you can recognize these two types of machines. But the magnetic field is actually very similar in both cases. So, I mean, uh, well, probably you cannot answer now, but uh, you can think, which kind of machine is this? And well, you've already guessed probably that it's a stellarator because what you see is actually the more or less naked helical field core structure. So that's, that's uh, actually a large helical uh, device and, and it's, it's in Japan. This is on the other hand, it's a tokamak. It's a nice symmetric machine, more compact. And actually you don't really see the coils because these are all superconducting coils. So these are inside this cryostat. This is the East Tokamak in China. And this is a tokamak where you can actually look into when, when they are pre repairing the tokamak, they, they used to just separate the two parts. I mean, this, this is one half of the tokamak here on the uh, lower right hand side. And, and the other part is here. This is the huge transformer coil drive, that drives the current. And, and this is a nice toroidal symmetric machine. That's, that was text or in, in Jülich. Uh, again, a stellarator. Well, it's not a classical one. This was one of the first stellarators, so it's, but it's definitely not toroidally symmetric. Nice tokamak. Usually, when you look into tokamak, you see something like this that the, the plasma edge is glowing because there you have relatively cold plasma where you still see the, the uh, still emits light here in the visible range. The center of the tokamak is so hot that it emits light, light, electromagnetic radiation in the, in the X-ray region. Okay, so if you have X-ray uh, vision, you would see the, the center of the plasma, but most of us don't. And this is, this is, this is again a, a stellarator, of course, with these crazy shaped coils. This is, this is a more modern stellarator. Okay, and we, we reached, uh, the, the, the tokamak, we are the proudest of. This is JET, Joint European Taurus. That's uh, in, in England, in Cullen, next to Oxford. And this red part is uh, the best part of the machine. It was designed and manufactured in Hungary. So we are very part of it. But uh, I mean, the, the whole machine was, was manufactured, the rest, uh, the basic structure before we joined the, the EU. So. It's, it's quite an oldish one, but still it's the largest one. And whenever this guy is not inside and we have some plasma, we see something like this. So again, the parts are showing up, which, uh, which are relatively cold and where the, the plasma interacts with the, uh, the, the uh, structures around it. And now it's heated up to fusion temperatures it's a bit unstable, but still, and well, that's, that's where the discharge ends. And this is the best we, can, we, we could do now. Uh, this, is, this is a machine that holds the record for the DT fusion power. And you can see here that it goes up, uh, up to uh, 16 megawatts. And 16 megawatts is a lot. I mean, it's about... Uh, 16,000 microwave ovens, so it's, it's a lot. It's really on industrial scale. We can produce DT fusion on industrial scale. Well, uh, on the downturn, it's, uh, 
it didn't take too long. So it was less than a second, this particular discharge. And the other thing that you had to heat the plasma with 25 megawatts to achieve this. So we are not gaining net power yet. That will be the, the task for the next machine. And to achieve that, we need to heat the machine, heat the, the plasma. One way is to inject highly energetic ions. These are neutral beam injectors. These are huge stuff. And which is very peculiar that if you already have fusion, you are making uh, these hot ions from fusion yourself by helium-4, and it can heat your machine. And it's very important not to lose these ions. But these ions can do very different, difficult to calculate orbits in, the, in such a complex machine. And they have some periodic motion. And it's very important to keep these inside of the machine. And I would like to show you a video about what happens when a, 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 an energetic particle, he will be the one, interacts with the rest of the plasma. And I mean, this is a plasma here, a fluid, with a very well-defined, nice symmetric boundary condition. And now this energetic particle energizes and it has a periodic motion. And the periodic motion, the periodicity equals the, the, the periodicity of the eigen wave of this plasma. And in each time they interact, they don't interact too much, but at the end, a lot of energy is transferred to the wave. And now we are in the stage of nonlinear interaction already, where the wave itself acts back on the particle and transports it out of the machine without it distributing much of its energy. So that's what we, we wouldn't actually like to happen. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, something that we, we try to calculate and, and uh, avoid in, in future machines. Okay, so this is just very quickly about the future. Uh, immediate future is ITER Tokamak. It's, it's being built in a worldwide effort, really. And uh, we are very happy that it's actually in Europe, in, in Cadaras, France, not, from, not far from Marseille. And the, it has an aim to produce uh, 10 times energy multiplication, which means that uh, we will have uh, 500 megawatts of fusion power for only 50 megawatts of heating power. And it should start operation in 2025. We'll see before of, because of COVID, we might have a slight delays, but, but uh, I mean, guys were really trying not to get delayed here. This is a huge machine. I mean, there are some people hidden there, but you probably don't see them because they are two pixels high. And uh, ITER on the other hand, will not produce electricity to grid. Uh, the machine that will do that is called DEMO reactor. And if ITER is successful, we will start building uh, the DEMO reactor. And this is now a European program, so it's not a worldwide program anymore. Uh, we have a, a fusion roadmap that aims to have a few hundred megawatts of power to grid by a fusion reactor by the 2050s sometime okay so it's not specified that exactly so that's the the longer time objective so just to summarize a bit with fusion power you can you can produce tremendous amount of energy from very little fuel uh, even even we are more effective than fission uh, deuterium is is abundant we have lots of it and and tritium can be produced from lithium in the reactor blanket uh, and lithium is abundant again. So we have lots of fuel if we can do this. The end product of the reactions that we actually use is, is not radioactive, not harmless in any way. It's noble gas, so even, even you can sell it. So it's, it's, uh, it would be very nice from that perspective. Uh, the way to do this is, is magnetic confinement fusion in a torus shaped machine. And there are two devices that can do that. Um, the bigger ones are tokamaks, but stellarators are also developing. And about the timeline, 
JET has demonstrated that we can produce uh, industrial amounts of fusion energy already in the 1907, uh, 1997, so it was quite a long time ago. The 10 times energy multiplication in the, in the plasma will be demonstrated by ITER, not in 2025, but maybe in 2035. Uh, the first fusion power plant will be DEMO. If Europe will be the first, maybe not. Maybe it will come five years earlier or 10 years earlier but by someone from the Far East or whatever, but in, in that range. And I would be very glad if fusion would really spread and produce most of our electricity in the future but uh, it's, it's spreading will be devil, uh, determined by, by uh, advances in, in, in high temperature superconductors in, in, and material science, because that will decide how expensive this technology will be. Okay, so well, that was my short summary talk about, uh, about fusion energy. And uh, well, anytime you can ask questions, uh, I hope we, we have some short time now as well. Yes, we do. Thank you very much, uh, Gergo, for the fantastic presentation. A uh, very interesting subject. Uh, just to say from European Nuclear Society side, we just had recently a uh, webinar on ITER with uh, the chair of ITER project, uh, Mr. Bigot. Um, so it is really the same schedule that you presented, the timeline. Uh, and we very much crossing our fingers that this project will be um, uh, in operation, fully commercial um, in a couple of years. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So if you are interested actually how the ITER uh, project looks like now that you can really uh, enter the site, we would like to invite you also to our YouTube video uh, where you can really feel like being uh, in the site because it's 3D demo, uh, 3D video and, and uh, you can visit it. It's also on the website as, as uh, Gerko is presenting. Okay, fantastic. So now uh, I would like to invite you for two questions. So we, before the coffee break, we can ask Gergo to... Um, we know, okay, there's one question coming from Mark and Arturo. We know that there is another method of confinement based on lasers. Is it true or just a theory? No, it's absolutely true. There's something called uh, inertia confinement fusion, where inertia means that uh, if you heat something up to immense amounts of, of, of uh, 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 energy density, uh, high pressures, uh, still it, it takes some time for it to, to spread, to explode. So the inertia of the, the material keeps it together for a while. And if your density is high enough, I mean, the, the, the reaction rate goes with the density squared because it, it's proportional to both the density of deuterium and, and, and the density of temperature. You might uh, have learned from, from uh, reactor kinetics. Um, and uh, if you produce very high density material, you can uh, produce uh, basically an explosion. And this is what happens in an H bomb. But of course, uh, it would be very hard to build a reactor about H bombs. Uh, so we would like to, to do way, way smaller. Uh, explosions, but if you have smaller explosion, it means smaller uh, 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 pellet of, of, of deuterium and tritium fuel, you have to achieve very high density so that it burns before spreading around in the explosion. And uh, there are people who think that they can achieve these high densities and temperatures with, with uh, compressing the fuel with lasers or particle beams. Uh, there is a famous experiment in, in uh, America, like National Ignition Facility, uh, but uh, they have uh, observed the very nice instabilities. I mean, from a physics, uh, physics point of view, it's, it's very nice and exciting, Rayleigh-Taylor type instabilities. Uh, 
but from the technical point of view, it means that the national ignition facility could not ignite the plasma. So uh, there are serious difficulties about this. And personally, I don't like explosions. So uh, I think that uh, in a reactor, industrial scale machine, uh, it would really be better to have something stationary going on and not uh, explosions and stuff. But it exists. Uh, nations spend a lot of money on it, especially nations who have uh, hydrogen bombs and are not allowed to test deals anymore. Uh, yet, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. And, uh, uh, well, I'm a big skeptical about it. It might happen that it, it will work. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so is there any more questions before the coffee break? Uh, we have, after the coffee break, uh, a laboratory with Gergo Pokol. So it's a, this is another chance to put him questions. So for the moment, I would like to invite you to have a short break. We are... Uh, so Emilia, can... excuse me, I see a hand from Team Confusion. Ah, I didn't see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I have got this question in a reactor. After we have heated up the plasma to those temperatures, how exactly would be the process to remove it from there if there are needed repairs on the tomah on the tokamak? What okay, exactly would that process be? It's a great question because it gives me chance to talk about something I, I missed, and it's in, actually it's it's quite important from the point of view of safety. And the thing is that with magnetic fields we cannot confine too much pressure. We are using crazy strong magnetic fields. I mean, uh, uh, 13 Teslas and, and, and so that uh, the highest fields that, that conventional uh, superconductors can handle. Uh, still, we cannot confine more than a few atmospheres of pressure of plasma. And, as pressure is, is the product of density and temperature, and you have crazy high temperatures, it means that you will have crazy low densities. So in a huge machine like ITER, I've shown you ITER, it's, it's like a cathedral. And in, in that cathedral, you will have only, only grams of material, deuterium and tritium at the same time. So very, very low uh, amount of material. And if, you, if anything happens to, to the, the confinement of the plasma, you will just uh, well, lose that material very quickly. It, it, uh, uh, it doesn't actually store a lot of thermal energy because uh, its, it's uh, amount is minute. So that adds to the safety of the machine as well. And, uh, and also it's, it's not uh, very hard to stop uh, uh, um, a plasma discharge in, in this kind of machine. It's, it's a bit harder to maintain the discharge in, in a steady state. Did I understand and your question well? Yes, thank you. The answer was great. OK, if I don't see any questions, now I make a full screen with all the teams. Uh, I would like to invite you for a short break. Uh, so see you in uh, eight minutes. I think there is a question in the chat. Ah, okay. Okay, so um, <laughs> so the, before we, we go to, okay. Um, final question from Petko. How do you model the nonlinear interactions between particles? Okay, that's a very good question. So um, in physics, even on university level, we usually start solving a problem, a physics problem, by linearizing the equations. Yet, uh, if you look at the plane equations themselves, uh, depending on, on your wave uh, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, participates in this, this particle wave interaction. You, you either use some, some partial differential equation or just some ordinary fluid equations. They have nonlinear terms. And if 
you do not linearize the problem, you will have these terms, just it will be quite hard to actually solve the equation itself. So that, that's why people usually linearize the problems and, uh, and uh, like, like in, a, in a pendulum, probably you've already calculated a pendulum, a, math, a mathematical pendulum. There you only calculate for, for small displacements because if a displacement is high, then, then you will have a, a lot of nonlinear terms entering and it will be difficult to solve. And the trick with nonlinear equations is that uh, they might have bifurcations where just you, you, you change the equation a little bit and suddenly the, the whole shape of the solution changes a lot. So that's a, a nonlinear physics and chaos theory is, is something that's, uh, that's very exciting uh, and, uh, and quite new. I mean, it, it, it came up with, with nuclear phys uh, numerical physics in the, in the end of the last century. So it's quite new. And uh, it's, it's very important in such nonlinear systems like uh, fusion plasma physics. So there is no simple question, uh, answer for your, for your, for your question. Uh, but in the equations, we have no linearity and how you actually solve it. Well, that's, uh, that's something you should, you should master. It's not easy. Okay, I, I don't see any more questions. No, me neither. Okay, so now it's really time for a break. So let us start maybe at uh, 4.35. So we have uh, 10 minutes, a proper break before we start the laboratory. Okay, see you in 10 minutes, 4.35.
Okay, we are slowly coming back to our session. Are you still with me, guys? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I would like to invite you all slowly um, to the last session of today, uh, to the lab with uh, Dr. Pokol on nuclear fusion. So that we will see some experiments uh, what he presented and we hope you're gonna like it. So I will try now this um, sharing the screen. Okay, before we start, I would like to make sure that you are all back with me and uh, that we can start. Say yes, <laughs> at least. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Yes, so, yes. Good. So we are on time, 4.35. So we have a 30 minutes uh, laboratory now with Dr. Pokol on nuclear fusion. This is the last thing of today. And afterwards, I would like to invite you to the quiz questions prepared by our team. Uh, so this uh, question, well, this quiz will be run by my colleague Matia. So after the lab, I would like to say goodbye to you. But first, let's watch together the laboratory prepared by Dr. Poco. Okay, I hope you will see it now. Enjoy. Amelia, the voice is not coming through to me. I'm sorry, it's not the right one. Uh, I don't hear anything. So did you did you tick the the share the the audio when you uh, shared your screen? Mm -hmm. There is an option of sharing audio when you share the Zoom screen in the Zoom sharing. Just let me try once again. Normally it's off. Share the sound, yes, now. Do you hear it now? Hello, I'm Gerger Pokol, and today I'm going to show you some plasma magic with a glow discharge tube. Well, this is the one. It's kind of an old fashioned device. This is the earliest devices that uh, could pr produce some plasma. And it produces low pressure plasma. So what we need is a vacuum system. This is our vacuum pump. It's a great vacuum pump. We don't need very good vacuum, uh, but, uh, well, we need some uh, uh, sufficient one. It's a membrane type vacuum pump. You will hear the membranes mu moving when it's switched on. So now I just uh, clamp it on to our discharge tube. The discharge tube itself is made of uh, glass which is very good to hold vacuum, yet we can see what's going on inside. Of course, you can do glow discharges in, in steel tubes as well, but, uh, well, for demonstration, it's uh, not optimal. Okay, I switched on the vacuum pump now and uh, closed the inlet valve. We can uh, let out the gases and also let in the gases from the vacuum tube. And this is the outlet of the vacuum pump. So when I put my finger there, I can sense if there's some kind of uh, gases uh, pumped out. The other thing that we will need is high voltage. This is a direct current um, discharge tube that uses uh, high voltage. High voltage means uh, two kilovolts in this case. 
And uh, this is a symmetric. Uh, for the anode, uh, electrons will be accelerated towards this electrode. And uh, we also need a negative voltage electrode, that's called a cathode. And we connect it there with, with special plugs designed for high voltages. Okay, you can see inside the tube. Uh, the copper electrodes, the the uh, cathode, which uh, is uh, negatively charged, it's uh, pointy, which helps the escape of electrons and the ignition of the tube. All metallic parts should be grounded. That's very important so that they are not charged up. Uh, charging things up for uh, to few kilovolts is is highly dangerous, and whenever everything's set up, then we can plug in the power supply. It's very important not to plug in the power supply as long as you are still fiddling with the the connectors. We can now switch on the power supply. Okay, put on some voltage there several hundred volts, both on, uh, on the positive and the negative sides. Of course, they add up. And uh, now both meters uh, were switched to voltage so that we can see it. And the discharge tube just ignited, OK? The color was a bit faint, so I switched uh, to to the, the meter to measure the milliamperes, the current flowing through, and increase the current a bit. Okay, increasing the current usually helps with having brighter light in the plasma. What the other thing that helps with the uh, having a better view of the plasma is, of course, uh, switching off the lights around. And that's what just happened here. And now we can beautifully see the uh, plasma that's composed of uh, negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions going, glowing uh, in a nice reddish color around the, the anode. And also around the cathode, we have some purplish light. That's the negative glow. And uh, in between, we have some dark region that's called the Faraday, Faraday dark space. OK, and this is Ursh, my uh, PhD student, who is helping out with these experiments. OK, if we, we focus a bit more on the light, uh, we see that uh, it's uh, glowing very nicely. And uh, in between, in the dark space, that's the, the, the place where the electrons get accelerated towards the cathode, but they still don't ionize. So uh, they still don't uh, produce light. And the main thing about this experiment, why we like to demonstrate it as fusion scientists, is that we can beautifully see that a magnet that's outside of the, the, the plasma itself, outside of the vacuum chamber, it has quite a definite effect on the plasma itself. So you can very easily control the plasma with a magnet like this. Okay, and this is exactly the principle of magnetic confinement fusion, where we confine the hot plasma needed for fusion in a magnetic chamber. Okay, magnet can affect the negative glow region as well, but not that much. Okay, now the negative glow is, is quite extended for the, the whole uh, cross-section of the tube. 
and uh, here we see the the cathode also glowing as the electrons hit it the magnet produces uh, also stripes in the plasma uh, frankly speaking, I've never ever calculated why it produces exactly the the, the 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 stripes it does, but it can also produce stripes spontaneously if we decrease the uh, pressure in the tube, and also we can increase the number of stripes by decreasing the current th flowing through this tube. Okay, so just now we decrease the current, we reduce the current, and we see that these stripes are now extended all along the plasma and also into the region of the negative glow, which is very interesting. It's an ancient experiment. Uh, these stripes have been seen already a hundred years ago. Still, there is still research going on to explain exactly what's happening in a plasma like this. Okay, it's, it's very exciting. Now we increase the current even more and stripes tend to disappear now. And another way to make them disappear is to add some more gas, which is just happening. We are using uh, plain air from the room. And now we added some more gas and we see a very nice continuous plasma column. That is the red one. And also the negative glow uh, became more intense. Now we added even more current. So this is more or less the brightest plasma that we can produce with such a device. Again, we can see that uh, the magnets are really great to, to, to play with these uh, plasmas. Uh, well, I'm kind of sad that uh, you cannot be here and play with it yourself. Usually we use this uh, device for demonstration and then uh, anyone can come from the public and uh, uh, try to produce some, some, uh, some uh, nice features in the plasma. And now we add more gas. We see that the negative glow now really is just in a small volume around the, the uh, uh, cathode. This is where the, the ions are accelerated towards the cathode. And actually most of the, um, the power goes to the cathode. And if we add enough gas, then the this negative glow region contracts more and more. And if we add too much gas, then the whole discharge disappears. Okay? So this clearly demonstrated that uh, in order to have this glow discharge in the plasma tube, we definitely need vacuum. Glass is a very nice material. One disadvantage it has is uh, that we shouldn't uh, allow it to be too hot uh, so that it doesn't break. So if we operate the machine for a very long time, then the few tens of watts that is uh, produced by the power supply can make it hot and we need fans to cool it. Okay, whenever the experiment is finished, we just uh, extinguish the plasma by opening the gas valve, uh, switch off the, the power supply, usually switch it off gently by scaling down the current and the voltages, switch off completely. Very important, before touching the connectors, we always uh, plug out things. 
and uh, we put the plug for the power supply to some visible place. And if we see the plug that it's not plugged in, then we can touch the connectors. And we just uh, disassemble the connectors. That's the easier part. The electric connectors are very handy. And uh, for the vacuum system, you just uh, need some experience so that you don't overdo things. Uh, like uh, putting on stru uh, screws too hard. Uh, don't you lose your seals. We have uh, uh, seals made of rubber because it's not a high vacuum system, so rubber is good enough for our purposes. And this is the disassembled tube that we can then transport. After having transported uh, the, this tube, we will. Uh, do the have to do the maintenance and uh, this is going to be a, a special exercise lab exercise when i also show you this part the preparation part you can see that uh, the transportation worked so it's not broken or anything but uh, we definitely need to clean clean it up Okay, you see that uh, the, the tube itself is colored a bit around the cathode. And uh, that's why we need to disassemble this from time to time. And the first thing to disassemble is uh, the, the protective plexi around the electrodes. That's uh, in order to protect the user from the high voltages. And after that, we can undo the screws that hold together the vacuum system. So this is the easiest way, basically, to assemble a vacuum system. Just take a tube and uh, take two caps on both sides, pull the caps together, and then uh, the, the tube is sealed. So these are the, the screws that pull the caps together. And now we are disassembling these screws so that we can take out the caps to, together with the electrode. This is the anode. This is the, uh, where the, the, the positive charge goes. And on the other side, we have the cathode, where the negative charge goes. And ions in the plasma are accelerated towards this electrode. And they sputter material from the electrode. So ions, when hit the electrode with uh, great velocity, they remove some of the part of the electrode. And that's why you see that it's so clean because it's kind of eroded away by the plasma. This is what we call plasma spattering. And all the electrode material uh, depo is, is, is deposited on the inside of the tube. Okay, so the... The, the plasma part, the anode part of the tube is clean, but the cathode part is, is uh, basically contaminated by, uh, uh, by, by copper from the electrode. So we need to clean it. And in order to clean it, we need to disassemble all parts that are, are not made of glass. These are the vacuum connectors. The seal there is uh, uh, also a rubber ring, but uh, metallic parts uh, are the, the this metallic screw puts on the stress on the, the rubber ring so that it fits tightly. You should be very careful not to break the, uh, the, the tube. It happened several times before. And now we have the, the, the glass tube itself, so we can just take it to sink and 
try to remove the copper from it. Okay, so this is our sink at the university. It's not too big, but uh, just big enough for this tube. And first we tried to remove the copper by plain water, by scrubbing. It wasn't very su uh, successful. And now we tried to use some dis dishwasher detergent. This was our first idea, of course. But you can see that it has some effect, but the tube is still uh, full of copper. So even with intense scrubbing, just uh, by using this dishwasher liquid, we, we cannot... Uh, remove the, these stains. And actually, it was a big project to try to find some material that can remove this. And uh, we went to the, the chemists and asked them, and uh, the idea was to use some kind of acid. And uh, there's a very mild acid that's freely available. It's vinegar. And it happened to work quite well. So that's what we regularly use now to clean our plasma tube. We always have some vinegar uh, at, at the university. Not for eating, but for plasma tube cleaning. And you will see that uh, if we put this scrubber into vinegar and attempt scrubbing, the copper just easily dissolves off the, the tube. Okay, so this is, this, is, uh, this is the part of the demonstration experiments that you don't usually see, but uh, for me personally, it was very exciting that we could uh, find some detergent that uh, works perfectly for our deposited layer. And actually, what we've just seen is also something that's, uh, that's also used in industry. So uh, plasma sputtering of material, uh, removing uh, the material from, from the electrode, is often used in, in, uh, in, in industry. Uh, if you need to remove some hundreds of nanometers or a, a micrometer or whatever. So very, very, very small quantity or just clean some material so that it's really clean. You use plasma sputtering. And also by depositing uh, layers on uh, surfaces, plain surfaces, you can make uh, very good mirrors in optics, for example. It's, it's very much used. Uh, if we continued to deposit uh, more copper, we eventually we would have got a, a mirror, not a very good one, but uh, but still a, a mirror. So this this is this these are actually applications in, in of these kind of plasmas in industry. Okay, so now I'll also show you how we assemble the tube. Of course, first we need to dry it. I didn't show you the drying part. I mean, it's kind of boring. <laughs> you put it down and let it dry. But after that, we need to insert the electrodes again. And it's very important that if you are producing something that, uh, that involves vacuum, you wouldn't like to touch the parts that go into the vacuum with your bare hands. The, the grease from your uh, hands can ruin the whole experiment. 
Okay, so whenever anyone touched these electrodes, we've spent ages trying to get rid of the, the grease. So we don't touch the things that go into the plasma, into the vacuum, but of course we, we, we can touch other things. Okay, it's very important not to break your uh, vacuum tube. This is also a part where you can easily break it when you try to put on the plugs and, uh, and tension it with the screws. Actually, it's a bit tricky that uh, you need to put on the tension on these screws and at the same time, you have to have the plugs in perfect position. So earlier on, we needed two people to assemble this. But, uh, well, now I'm more experienced, so I can just try to center the plug so that uh, it's, it's perfectly centered and uh, the vacuum seal is, is perfectly around the, the ends of the tube and then tension it at the same time. Okay, um, we do not need a lot of torque on these screws. So it would be actually very easy to break the whole stuff if we put on too much torque. So we just do it with our bare hands. And then we continue with uh, assembling the the plugs that will go towards the vacuum pump. This is the seal that goes on. It's already very tight, but by screwing this on, we can make it even tighter. In fusion plasma physics, we use a bit different vacuum technique because uh, there we need uh, high vacuum. And uh, in high vacuum, you can no longer use rubber as seals, for example. So typically in fusion, we have steel vacuum chambers and the seals themselves are made out of uh, copper. And you need to tension the screws there pretty hard. Okay, so it's um, demonstrating plasma with a fusion device is uh, not nearly as uh, exciting as, as with this kind of plasma tube that you can actually touch and play along with the magnet to see how, how a magnet affects the plasma position and uh, how it can be used to control the plasma from outside of the vacuum chamber. Yet the principle is very similar. So in infusion plasmas, we use vacuum chambers, put magnets around. Just there, the uh, vacuum tube doesn't have these two endings where it will touch electrodes, but it's kind of bent over to a toroidal shape so that it has no ends. And uh, then we can produce a toroidal magnetic field that perfectly uh, confines the plasma inside the vacuum chamber without anywhere touching actually the chamber. Okay, so again, We've put on the vacuum connectors, and then this is a more or less standard connector we can connect to the vacuum pump. And it's also kind of a principle that whenever you work with vacuum, before using the device, you have to suppose that your vacuum is not perfect. So you have to test your vacuum. And, well, in this case, we can test the vacuum by just uh, switching on the vacuum pump. 
okay so this is how we are connected to the vacuum pump you've seen it in earlier in the video and when we just switch it on you can hear that it's switched on membranes are moving the gas is being pumped out and this is where the gas comes out so just by touching it you can feel if uh, the gas has, uh, is, is really flowing out you can see that i still haven't assembled the the plexi protecting from the high voltage because uh, we don't have any high voltage here we are just testing the, the vacuum pump uh, and the pumping of the vacuum. And if I need to fix the, the, the tensioning of the caps or the, the position of the caps, then of course the, the, the plexis is, uh, would be just uh, hindering it. Okay, so actually it, uh, this vacuum pump works quite quickly. Uh, we need some time for, for pump down. We need to test the vacuum also when we are moving the uh, cathode. We need to move it because when we are igniting the plasma, we need to, the cathode and anode to be close together. But when, we, when the plasma is ignited, we can increase the distance and have a long plasma tube. And this is our way of measuring the vacuum based on the sound of the vacuum pump that you should soon hear to change. Okay, not very scientific. But still, uh, as we don't have a vacuum meter, uh, this is uh, our experience that we can check the vacuum like this. And our conclusion now is the vacuum is good enough so that we can do the final steps of the assembly of the tube. And now, at the end, we will have... a. Uh, nice clean plasma tube with which we can go and demonstrate the principles of confining a plasma with magnetic field and with this i would like to thank ursh and titanilla who helped me with making this video thank you very much uh, now we are back after the laboratory. Are you back with me? Uh, Dr. Pokol, thank you very much for the laboratory session. It was very interesting and unfortunately the, the students cannot be in live and, and watch it and test it and touch it. Uh, but it was really great video to, to be at least next to you and, and to understand um, the physics behind. Um, okay, is there... There are any questions now? Let's go, please. No, I'm just clapping. <laughs> it was really interesting, indeed. Do you have any comments, questions, impressions? I will ask you for this anyway on Friday, but uh, are there any fresh impressions that you would like to share? Something that you didn't know, that you observed, that you learned, that you felt is really interesting to follow after your um, final exams. Actually, uh, may I answer a question that came up earlier in the chat? Sure, please. Just I didn't recognize. It was from Petko, and uh, as he also complimented my uh, Russian knowledge, language knowledge, I, I uh, tend to feel that I should answer this question. So uh, um, 
His question was about uh, alternative concepts when we don't use uh, magnetic uh, fields to confine the plasma. We already talked about inertial confinement fusion where we just blow up things, but there are other ways. Uh, for example, uh, uh, like uh, using mechanical shock waves in, in, uh, in, uh, in fluids and stuff like that. Um, and uh, if you just uh, listen to the media, you can hear uh, claims about uh, such alternative concepts from time to time. And uh, uh, my view on that is that usually these are very exciting uh, experiments that the people are proposing to, uh, to do fusion with it. But uh, I am usually quite skeptical. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, not that easy to do fusion in, uh, in, with magnetic fields. It takes a lot of time to develop these machines. It takes uh, huge machines to be developed. Uh, and uh, people have been searching for, for shortcut for, for several decades now, and uh, they never succeeded. Uh, these ideas are, are nice. I mean, uh, having, uh, having shock waves in, in a uh, rapidly rotating uh, um, uh, liquid metals and stuff like that. So this is exciting. And of course, it's very hard to model as well and, and prove that it's really hopeless. So that's why people get money for their experiments. Um, but uh, I'm uh, really skeptical about alternative concepts and really pro-magnetic confinement fusion. So that's, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say about this question. But I don't know if there's, there are other questions as well. I'm looking for further questions. I think everybody's getting ready for the quiz now. Uh, are there further questions? Please raise your hand. This is the last chance. To put okay, a and this is my last, last chance to, to thank for your patience to view my very first uh, edited video. So, <laughs> uh, well, maybe with time, if we have similar occasions, I will be uh, better in this, but uh, I would rather have you all in, in Hungary and uh, touch the things yourself. Yeah, we would definitely be better in Budapest uh, and, and really follow the, the lab uh, physically uh, in reality. Um, Budapest is a great city to be and uh, Sheila was really disappointed that they, she cannot welcome all of you in this and her beautiful city. Uh, but yeah, that's the reality. Thank you very much, Pokal. You should get also the award for the best video. So fantastic. Uh, well done. Uh, so now I think it's time for our quiz. So I will give a floor to my colleague, Matja. Yes, uh, here we are. Master of the quiz session. <laughs> I'm sending right now the link. Just let me uh, switch to the link page. Uh, just one moment. I'm just to show. As yesterday, so as yeah, a as team, yesterday. there's only one device per team. Okay, now you should see it. I'm going to present the quiz and waiting for your registration. And today it should be full screen. I hope the video quality will be also better than yesterday. So let's see if there are some people coming. Okay, you're very fast. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Looking also at your answers yesterday. So we have 14 participants. We can wait uh, a bit for the missing Three, I think. Okay. Here we are. 16. The last one. Okay. So I think we are ready to start today. Today you also, uh, as for yesterday, your close answer, but you have 30 seconds to 
answer to each uh, question and if you're ready we can start uh, right now with the first question so the proposed fuel of fusion power plant is remember professor Diego presented today and the answers are coming One team missing. Okay, everyone has voted. Perfect, and the right answer is hydrogen. Congratulations. Then let's go to the second question. For nuclear fusion on heart, we need 100 million degrees of plasma as much as fuel in the sun, an H-bomb or a tokamak. I don't see you replying very fast. million degree of plasma in the solution to most of you then let's go for the third question start the countdown so the question is the proposed deuterium tritium fusion reaction produce helium iron water or nuclear waste put it very fast and yes the correct answer was helium let's move to the fourth question fourth question is free electrons and ions in hot plasma can be contained by magnetic fields in a strong steel vessel by mental power and strong will by electric fields My magnetic field, as explained by professor before. Then let's move to the fifth question. The eater tokamak is expected to produce more fusion power than the eating power injected into the plasma when? Around 2050, never, by 2035-37 or in 2021. answer was by 2035-37 let's move to the sixth and now i think we are moving to nuclear medicine if i'm right yes hospitals are interesting for physicists because they are dynamic place to work in they employ a lot of people they are full of very sophisticated equipment and software and they paid a good salary Oh, good reason, I could say, and everyone has voted. And yes, congratulations. All. Next question, number seven. Diagnostic and interventional radiology equipment is important because it uses very complex equipment, help us see inside the body without opening up the body, can be used for seeing inside Egyptian mummies, or it uses X-rays. That's exactly the correct one, is this one. Let's move to the eighth question.
the medical physicist physics profession is more important is most important because you need to be a good physicist and mathematician you learn about human anatomy it helps save people's li lives and uh, it's a forward-looking profession you want to missing that one and yes the correct one is here to save people's lives then question number nine nuclear medicine equipment is important because it uses radioactive tracers, some of it uses positrons. We can check whether our human organs are working properly. We need to protect patients from radiation. Everyone has already voted. And yes, we can check whether our human organs are working properly without opening them, as Dr. Tulp anatomy lesson show you. And then the last question, the number 10, let's start the countdown. Which of the following organizations represents medical physicists in Europe? AAPM, EFOMP, EIA, or IOMP? Last missing answers. Two seconds. Okay, time is up and let's see who is the today's winner. Yes, the correct answer is the second one. Let's see who won today's quiz. And Alpha Race won the gold medal today. They've been the fastest. Congratulations to you and to your team for today's victory. And congratulations to all participants. Today has been a very challenging quiz. And I hope to see you again all together tomorrow for the last quiz on uh, the presentation of this nuclear competition. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mattia. Congratulations to Alpha Race. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo for today. Very well, girls. Okay, uh, so we are done for today. Uh, I hope you are ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow we will have the four last competitors, Fission Mission, Confusion, Anfra, and PRHG. Okay, uh, that's it for today. Uh, tomorrow you will receive also after the quiz the questionnaire on your impressions of this competition. And on Friday we will have the final day of the uh, closing ceremony and awards. Okay, good luck for tomorrow for the last four teams and see you tomorrow at uh, from 1.30 we are here online. Congratulations. Goodbye. Have a nice goodbye. evening. Bye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye.